All right, good morning, good morning. Well, it is fantastic to be with you all again, and um, we're going to pick up, continue in the Gospel of Matthew, but before you turn to Matthew 26, go ahead and go to Luke 22, because we're going to pick up something that Luke's Gospel talks about that Matthew doesn't have, and I want to just highlight this. So, hopefully, last week's message was encouraging, uplifting, and hopefully very informative, that the God of the universe not only is fulfilling Passover in such a profound way, but he's also betrothing his disciples at the same time. He's adding greater significance to Passover. Passover is actually the largest, I'm sorry, not the largest, the longest celebrated feast uh, in the world, okay? And what's amazing about that is that it literally all points to Jesus. Now, when we do our, our, our Messianic Passover um, as a church, we'll go through more details of that, go through the cups, go through all of the different stuff, showing how all of these things point to Christ. But what's amazing about this is, remember, Jesus said that particular Passover, he earnestly desired to eat with his Passover, uh, I'm sorry, with his disciples. So why, why was that such a significant one for him? Because his hour had come. The time had come for Jesus to indeed be the Messiah. He has to die in the right way, at the right time. Everything has to be just right. If he doesn't do that, he's not the Messiah. And the Lamb of God has come for the purpose of taking away the sins of the world. But something even more significant than that, if that's not enough, is that he came to reconcile relationship with God. Something that I think we really take for granted. Why would God want to have relationship with you? Because you're special? Because, you're, because there's love there. There's a love that is truly unimaginable how great this love of, of this God is. It's a love that we cannot use the world's standards of love to try and understand the love of God. The world perverts love. But love that comes from God is absolutely pure. It's, it's, it's unspeakable of the glory and the depth that's there in it. We get, a, we get a definition of love in the Bible, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it tells us what love is. So what does that tell us? It tells us how our love should be looking to one another. It's how we should be interacting with one another. Where that love should be manifesting its most greatest fruit is within your marriage, is with your children. If that ain't happening, you need to ask yourself why. That's your hard heart. That's my hard heart. That's the callousness of the, of the flesh of man. It has to die. That's why everything is predicated upon this walk with Christ. The, the flesh has to be crucified. It has to die with Christ in order that we can be raised to new life. If that's not happening, we need to ask ourselves why. What's going on? What's taking place? What is preventing this from happening? And, and look, there's multiple reasons why that happens and why that takes place. Um, One of the primary aspects of where that takes place is the way that we think about God. How we think about him affects everything else around us. It affects our relationship with God. It affects our relationship with one another. It affects our marriage, uh, uh, our kid. It affects everything. Everything. Um, I've, I've encouraged you know, men to attend the men's group. We had a, a fantastic men's group yet again exploring this, talking about the sovereignty of God. What is it? What does it encompass? Because maybe, I don't know if you've ever have, have interacted with people that ask the question, if you supposedly serve an all-powerful good God, why is there evil in the world? Anybody ever get this question? Okay, a few heads are nodding. That's easy to answer. It sounds really difficult, but what is being implied in that question? If God is truly all-powerful, he must not be good. Because if he was good, he would stop the evil. So he must not be good. He has the power to do it. He's just unwilling. Therefore, he's not a good God. I can't follow your God. And by the way, there are Christians 
air quote, Christians, that will be Christians for many years. They have even been prominent in Christian circles, lifted up on, on the platforms, published books, and they have walked away from the faith because you know why? They have said, I can't follow a God that would send people to hell. It's like, you just now got to that question? How have people put you on platforms and publish all your stuff? You've just now are asking this question? Go read a book. That has been discussed for a very long time in church history, examining these things. None of these questions we ask are new. None of them. Okay. Likewise, the other side of it. Okay, so if God is all-powerful, he must not be good if he allows evil to happen. Well, what about conversely? Maybe God is good, but he's not all-powerful. He's unable to stop the evil. Therefore, evil is stronger than God. That make sense? If he's truly good and he has the power to stop it, but he doesn't stop it, he must not be good. Or he may be good, he just lacks the power to be able to stop it. Neither of those conclusions are true. However, you then have to ask the question, is God then the author of evil? And I've actually interacted with a Jewish man who pulled a verse out of Isaiah, and that's exactly what it sounds like, but it's not a proper interpretation. But if God is fully sovereign, he's controlling all things, and he has power over all things, and then would that mean that he is then authoring all evil? Not only does he author all evil, he ensures that it happens. It must come about. But then what do you do when James says that God is not tempted with evil, nor does he tempt anyone with evil? But each person is lured away by their own desires. And when that desire has been conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. See, what happens when we, the way that we think about God affects everything else about us and how you theologically construct him in your mind will be how you interpret all the scriptures. And do not think for a moment that your theological presupposition, what that is, is simply the way that you suppose God is and behaves. That affects how you read this book. That's why it has been written that nothing is easier than to think there's nothing more difficult than to think well. And if you think that your thinking is right all the time, you think wrong. What's even worse is that when we take passages out of the Bible and we just glom onto those and go, okay, I've now made a theological framework in which I will interpret all the rest of Scripture through. And in this men's group, we went through this extensively, talking about what does the scripture actually reveal about the character of God? I don't know about you, but I don't want to believe something that's inaccurate of him. I only want to believe truth. That means at all times, every single belief structure that I have is always on the table of conversation, willing to be investigated, interrogated, and been proven wrong. Because I don't want to believe lies. I don't want to believe little constructs I make up in my mind that make me feel good. I want to know who the God of the Bible is, and I want to conform to him. I don't want anything else. So this takes an act of God to do that in us. And this is why Jesus predicates the entire Christian life must, it must, it must possess the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's not just for certain denominations that float around with it. There are some denominations that totally abuse the things of the Holy Spirit. There's other denominations that totally ignore the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, you cannot walk this Christian life with me without the Holy Spirit. It is the necessity, the very absolute necessity for the Christian life. But the Bible tells us we can reject him. We can silence him. We can quench him. We can even grieve him. So, who is this God? Who is this God that we, that we gather on Sunday mornings to sing songs to? And by the way, y'all sounded wonderful this morning. Not only that we gather to sing and extol his name, but we also gather to study the word. 
We go through verse by verse in the Bible so that the Bible tells us what to think about God. Tells us what to think. But it's very difficult to break the theological conceptions that we have of God even when we read it directly in front of us. That something should be challenging my construct of God. Let me prove it to you. Luke chapter 22. Jesus just does, does Passover. He does this amazing, uh, the, the, goes through the whole thing. He then betrothed his, his disciples. He's marrying them. He prophesies about when it's going to come. He tells, every, these guys lived with Jesus for three years. And look at the theological construct they have of God. Luke chapter 22, verse 34. Right after Jesus does all of these things, a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. Do you see what's starting to happen here? They're jockeying for position. Which is the better follower? Which is the one that's more committed? Which is the one that's more holy? Which is the one that's more fill in the blank? They begin disputing one another of which one of them is actually the better disciple. Can I tell you, God has such patience with us. Such patience with us. Jesus says to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as the one who serves. For who is the greater? One who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. I'm going to pause here. You know what the irony of this whole interaction with God is? Literally just a few hours before this dispute takes place, maybe not even a few hours, probably even less, it actually would have been less time than that. It would have been like maybe an hour had passed. Jesus got down on the ground and washed their feet. And these cocky people are going, look how great I am, and they start fighting amongst one another who's better. That same religious spirit exists today in the church. It's still here. It's still alive and well. It hasn't gone anywhere. It still exists. And here is God, literally just had washed their feet an hour ago, and they're arguing which one of them was greater. And Jesus just gave them an entire instruction about don't talk like this. An hour goes by, they're talking like that. This is how difficult it is to begin breaking the conceptions that we have in our minds. And if you don't believe that you do this, then you don't believe the scripture. Because the scripture says at the heart of man, the depth of who we are, it's deceitfully wicked. Do you know what that means? It means you will deceive yourself constantly. And you even have the ability, your, your flesh is so sinful, it will even justify spiritually all the, all the claims you make of yourself. That's how this works. That's the religious spirit. That's the flesh nature. And they're beginning to do it. It's manifesting itself with this point with the disciples on which one of them is greater. And Jesus saying, look, I did not take the position of reclining at table with you. I got down and I served you. I've been serving you for three years. How has it not penetrated your heart and mind? How has it not gripped you to to recognize, reflecting upon, is the word of God doing anything within you? The disciples weren't self-reflective. You know, this was the problem with the Pharisees too. The Pharisees, religious spirit on on max, they assumed the way the Messiah should come. Do you all remember when we've gone through this, the Gospel of Matthew, we're looking at there was two predominant rabbis and people generally took one of the two positions and they believed that when the Messiah come, he was going to look just like them, behave just like them, act just like them. Because why? Because they're the chosen ones. So he's going to be just like us. And you know how he's going to behave? I'm going to tell you how he'll behave. The Pharisees say he's going to help us fill in the holes in our fence. 
Remember how we talked about the different eras of the Pharisees? There was these different ideas of thought that they were creating the fence around the law. You have heard it said such and such, Jesus says, but I say such and such. He's challenging the, the thinking of the Pharisees, the religious teaching instruction of the day. And guess who didn't want to hear it? The chosen frozen. We are selected, we are chosen, and no one's going to tell us anything different. No one. I have made up my mind, and that's all there is. And now that someone's challenging me, I need to get rid of him. Jesus was extremely popular, folks. Extremely great crowds followed him. He taught the same message everywhere he went. But to the ones that were sick and need of a physician, that message was life, it was healing, it brought them deliverance. But to the religious, same message, it was received as how? Heresy. It was heresy. We need to get rid of him, eliminate him. We need to execute this one. He's challenging us. How dare him? And even the very ones walking with Jesus also had wrong theological conceptions of God. Which one of them was greater? Which one of them was more important and, and better for the kingdom? Jesus is saying, this is not at all what I've come to instruct you on. I've come to set spiritually dead people free and give them life. Why do you not take this? Because the reason why our conceptions of who we think God is affects the deepest part of us, everything, even the way that we'll read the Bible. And proof texting is one of the most common things that happens. What's proof texting? I've mentioned this before. Proof texting is where you take a verse, you read it, that verse alone, maybe two with it, and you create a theological idea from off that verse, taking the verse out of context. There's, you, know, you understand what authorial intent is, right? What is the intent of the author? What is the author wanting to convey? We're in a culture today that you can change authorial intent, and that's, that's approved of. They literally train kids to do this in school. I, I need you to understand this. Like This is very normal. This is a normal process now. This is why you can have somebody read something, and they'll say, well, this means to me, fill in the blank. Well, it doesn't really matter what it means to you. What is the author's intent? Does that make sense? But proof texting subverts all of that, and it says, I'm going to take a verse out, and I'm going to say, well, this is what it means to me, not taking it in relation to what is the author's intent within the surrounding context, within the context of the, grade of, of, of the letter or the book, depending on, on which it is in the scripture, and in context to the entire scripture. Because though this book was written by multiple authors, there is ultimately a supreme author, amen? And that supreme author has intent of what he Im implies this thing to mean. And we are to conform to that revelation. His disciples weren't getting it. They were missing it. And they walked with the man for three years. How much more so for you and me is it critical that we allow the Spirit of God to teach us what the Scriptures actually mean? rather than just going by what I want it to mean or what somebody tells me it means. Amen? Amen? This is why I emphasize to you, this, what we do on Sunday morning, should simply complement what already is going on with you and God throughout the week. There should be such radical changes going on within you throughout the week that Sunday is not a day that you look forward to go, oh, finally I'm going to get some instruction to hear something from the Lord. No, that should have been happening all week, and this should complement what, what he's already been doing. And those of you that have shared with me things that God has been doing with you on the week, that then when we come to Sunday, go, oh, man, that's exactly what God was working with me all week on. It's like, isn't that, isn't that something? <laughs> it's almost like there's a unity in the Spirit. But we miss that. We miss that. And this is something, beloved, that I want to stress and emphasize from last week. It's that unity in the spirit that God has come to bring us. He reconciled us to the Most High God that we can have relationship with Him, be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Where no longer do we need to go to a temple or a building to worship, but He makes our bodies His temple. He dwells with us. 
That was not possible to happen before Jesus did what he did. This is why it's important. What do we do with our bodies? What do we do with them? What are we doing with our life? I'm no longer my own, but I have been bought with the price. There is now a new possessor of who I am. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm now a slave to righteousness. Are you a slave to righteousness that when you fall into sin, it convicts you and it grips you? Or the word of God, when you hear it, it's like, oh, man, I still got so much room to grow. I thought I arrived, but I sure didn't arrive. Or does it, take, does it build pride within you? Look how much Bible knowledge I know. I'm so knowledgeable. Or is it that I'm going, I'm taking that knowledge and going to people and snatching them out of the fire? It's, it's burning within me that there's, there's life within me. I'm not a little better version of myself. My old self has to die so the new man can live. This is the entire gospel, guys. This is what Jesus has come to do. It was promised from Genesis all the way through, and the, and the fulfillment finally came in Christ. It arrived, and the disciples miss it. Which one of them is the greatest? God, we do the same thing in Christianity today. The same thing. Verse 28, you are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you as my Father assigned to me a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. You see what Jesus says to them? Not only did they not realize what God had done for them and was doing for them, they didn't even know what, they're, what they were receiving. They didn't even know what was being assigned to them. God was assigning to them his very kingdom. He was granting it to them. And not only that, but they're going to sit on these, on, the, on these 12 thrones and judge the tribes of Israel. We'll go into more depth on what all that stuff means at another point. Because this is talking about the millennial kingdom. This is talking about how all this is going to look when Christ returns, the millennial kingdom is, is set up. This is what he's talking about. There's something pretty significant that they're going to get to be doing. But they didn't get it. He's told them this before. They didn't get it. How many times have you ever had this happen where you had to be told the same thing over and over and over until it finally clicked? Am I the only one? Has anybody else had that? Yeah? Okay. How about this? Parents with older kids. Have you ever had your child come up to you and say, man, I just like heard the greatest thing. I can't believe what so-and-so just told me. It like blew my mind. And you as a parent going, I have literally said that a hundred times to your face. Anybody, parents ever experienced that? Yeah. Man. It just, it's like there's something that happens. Do you understand that you are, it, it is possible that we might have spiritually deaf ears sometimes? Do you believe that's possible? Do you believe that we might spiritually have blinded eyes that don't see? Do you believe that it's possible that we might have, you know, spiritually hardened hearts that don't want to receive, want to stay with what, wherever we're at and be comfortable with it? Do you think that we ever get out of the possibility of that happening? I don't think we do. Because why? The flesh nature is at enmity with God, and it wants to keep fighting the things of God. But you know what the flesh nature is so good at? It's crafty, and it will spiritualize its hardness. It will spiritualize its deafness. It will spiritualize its blindness. And it keeps us in captivity and bondage. Christ said, I've come to set you free free you from all of these things. So now let's look what happens here. We'll stay in the Gospel of Luke and then we'll flip over uh, to the Gospel of Matthew because again, Luke highlights some things that Matthew doesn't say and I just want to point some of these things out. So now as Jesus says this to all of them, he now turns and he says, Shimon, Shimon, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready. I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. 
Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. All of us are probably very familiar with this text. Let us for a moment examine this text, just for a moment. First off, why does, why does Jesus turn to Peter and call him Simon? And he says his name twice, not once, twice. So in the first time, Jesus is going to do the same thing in the garden. Did Jesus forget that he calls Simon Peter? I mean, in fact, it was Jesus that changed his name to Peter. Hey, listen, your name's Simon. I'm going to call you Peter. Did Jesus, like, have a lapse in memory going, oh, hey, what, what, was that, what was that name I gave you? That, would you Simon, listen, Simon, of course not, right? That's not what's happening. So why Simon? Why is he calling him in Hebrew, Shimon? Why, are you, why is he referring back to Peter as Simon? You know why? Because Simon, Shimon, the name means to hear, listen, and tell. He's saying, listen up, Simon. I need you to listen close. Simon, he emphasized the name, saying it again. Simon says it again. He's emphasizing, pay attention. What does he say? Behold. Whenever you read in the Old Testament, especially when it says behold, for the reader, it's like pay attention really closely because what's about to be said is unexpected. Behold, Satan demanded to have you. The you here in the Greek is plural. He's referring to all of the disciples. Satan has demanded to have you. This takes us back. Who else did Satan go before the Lord and ask that he may have? Job. Ah, oh, so see a connection here. So just like Satan went before the throne of God to say, listen, the only reason why Job serves you is because you make him comfortable. Take away his comfort, he'll curse you to your face. Okay. Right? And we see this situation carry out in Job. Job's not who we're talking about. We're talking about the disciples right now. Similar contrast, Satan's demanded to have you all. But I have prayed that your faith may not fail. So there's a few things going on here. Notice Jesus is saying to Peter, pay attention, Peter. Something's about to happen that you, you don't know anything about. There's spiritual warfare going on for your soul. Do you understand that? I'm not sure if we entirely do. And the reason why is because if we were, we would be more familiar with the, with the ways that the enemy fights. If you want to learn how to fight an enemy in war, you learn your enemy's tactics, you learn his weapons, you learn how he functions. It's one of the things that Patton was able to do so well in World War II because the Nazi tank commander was so proud, he wrote a book on what he does. Patton said, I read your book, blankety blank. He knew how his enemy was going to fight, and he used his pride and arrogance against him. Do you understand how the enemy fights? The enemy fights exceptionally well. He's very good at his craft. But what's more shocking is how limited Christians' understanding of the enemy is, how limited the understanding of his tactics are, and how limited our understanding of the Most High God and what he has done is. That's what's more shocking, because we are literally in spiritual warfare all the time. All the time. It's going on around us all the time. This last um, Wednesday... There's nine of y'all that joined me for the Walk for Life. Man, so proud of y'all for coming to that and being a part of that. And one of the things that we, that we had take place, there was quite a few people there. When I asked people that, that I knew that were up there that were part of it, helping put it together, I said, is this more than last year? They said, yes, it is. I said, man, what a blessing it is. But when the father, the bishop prayed, the Catholic priest paid, prayed, I didn't pray with him. I don't, I have a lot of differences with Catholic theology. And when you go and you start praying off by asking the saints to intercede, I, I stop right there. I go, I can't continue with you. But I watched. And the majority of that crowd that was there all did this at the end of the prayer. I went, oh my gosh, the majority of the people here are Catholics. If the Catholics didn't show up, this event would have been a waste. But you want to know what happened afterwards? When we got all lined up for our march and we go out for our march, lo and behold, there is a Christian on the corner with an amplification system and a microphone blasting the Catholic Church for how evil they are. I have issues as well with Catholic doctrine. That was not the time or place to do it. 
You go further up the road, there's a couple more with their amplification systems doing the same thing. You know what that tells the world? They are so divided, they can't even stand on the issue of life. And they didn't even join the march. You're right, Frankie. They were just standing there with their microphones. It's the enemy looking to divide. But I tell you what, those people doing it, I guarantee you thought they were, do they were in the right. They thought they were in the right. Absolutely telling them, trying to snatch people from I'm going to condemn all these people here so that they understand they need to be saved. It would have been done from a self-righteous spirit. And see, and this is the thing, guys. This stuff is all over the place. How we navigate. It's how we think about stuff. It's how we think about others. Have you ever found yourself judging somebody else spiritually because they watch or listen or do something that you don't think is right? Oh, pfft. man, I can raise both hands. I've absolutely been standing in that self-righteous kill for a long time. Firmly planted. Ain't no one going to get me off because I can justify every belief structure I have. The flesh nature will do this. And we witness this take place here. And it's, it's, a, it's a heartbreak to see. But here is what Jesus is saying. There is spiritual warfare all around us. And Satan is literally asked to sift them like wheat. So that you know how wheat was harvested in the day. After they went and cut it out of the field, they took it to a threshing floor. They would take a pitchfork. They would generally do this outside. And they would... And they would put their pitchfork in it and throw it up in the air so the wind would blow away the chaff, so just the kernel of wheat was left. But they weren't done. They would then take that wheat, they would put it in either a strainer or a sieve, and they'd shake it violently so that the dust and all the dirt and debris will blow away that only a good kernel remained. And this is what Jesus is saying. Satan has demanded that he can shake you violently. All of you. But I have prayed for you. We also read in John 17, you want to read what that prayer is? Go read it. That prayer also includes you and me, by the way. It talks about, and all those that are going to follow me. Jesus, intercede on our behalf this night. Okay? And here we have Jesus saying something, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Your trust in me won't fail. Your belief in me won't fail. It means what Satan intended to do was going to be so, so violent to them, spiritually speaking. It could, have, it could have manifested any way physically. But so violent spiritually that it was going, it, the disciples literally risk losing all faith in God. Do we ever read of a moment like that happening prior in the scriptures? Hope we say yes because we covered it. Previous in the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus was on the boat with all of his disciples and he was asleep in the boat and the great storm and wind and all that stuff was going on, the disciples were scared. They thought they were going to die. And it literally says that they dilosed. They had such fear. It was a, it was a fear that was more than just being afraid. Remember, these, some of these guys are seasoned fishermen. This is where they grew up. <laughs> they grew up doing this work. They knew these shores. They knew the patterns of the seasons. They knew, they knew everything about this lake everything about it. But at this moment, there was something unique about this storm that they were absolutely beyond petrified. And they all thought they were going to die. And in the Bible, it says they, they had a dilos, a fear. That word we covered before, it's literally an abandonment of trust in God. They lost all faith in Jesus, that he had no way to rescue or save them. That word shows up again in the book of Revelation. It's used very little. It shows up again in Revelation. It says, those that dilos do not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So what they did, they lost trust and faith in Christ because some difficulty came. Something was outside of their control. But Jesus also talked about this in Matthew 13, about the parable of the sower and the condition of the heart. That for many people, when the word of God goes out, it springs up, this, this excitement in them, and it's like a plant that springs up real quick. But then what happens to that little plant? The sun comes up, because the plant had no root, it withered quickly and it died. Jesus interprets it for us and he says, this is like the person who hears the word of God, they get super excited for a moment, but then when the persecution comes, they abandon trust and faith in God because there was no root in them. Jesus is saying, this work that is coming, Satan's already has done this within you disciples once already, where you lost your trust and faith in me. And he's asked to do it again. But I've interceded on your behalf. 
And notice what he says to Peter. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. You guys catch that? When you have turned again. What do you all think that might be? It's coming back to Jesus. It's a repentance. It's the word epistrepho. Do you all remember when we covered the words of turning mind and changing mind in here? We did metanoia, strepho, the Hebrew word shuv. We looked at it, Old Testament. What does it mean to turn? Does anybody remember that? Okay, some, some nodding heads. Okay, so remember, this is epistrepho. This is turning back. It's turning one's entire being back to the Lord. Not just my, I had a mind change. When I have turned everything back and started following after God, Peter, when you do this, Go and strengthen your brothers. Have you ever wondered why some Christians, we call them backslidden Christians? It's because Satan is literally after your soul. He wants to destroy us. Does nobody remember Jesus' words in John 10? For the thief comes to what? Steal, Steal, kill, and what? That's his mission. So now we know what his mission is. So now, how does he do it? Well, that's not this message. But he has tactics, and Jesus is flat out saying to him, but where does Peter, where's Peter's at? What, what is Peter here? How does Peter respond? Uh, well, Lord, uh, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both the prison and the death. Peter had confidence in his own faith, his own strength. His own mind. His confidence was found in himself, not in the one who actually gives strength. And this is where Jesus basically says, Son, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you may know me. You know, this this is so powerful, this point of Scripture. Peter, Peter ends up understanding this, because when you read later in his letter, 1 Peter chapter 5, he actually says the devil prowls around like what? The boy learned his lesson, seeking whom he may devour. He did not, He didn't hear it now, but he realized, man, once he went through what Christ said he was going to go through, he realized, man, my strength means absolutely nothing. Amen. Amen. Okay. Also, how much better is it somebody that has gone through this, that has backslidden and fallen into sin, that they thought, I thought I was free of this garbage, but here I am back in this again. God would never, ever take me like this is ridiculous. How could I profane God so much? How could I diminish and disdain him like this? You know, This is one of the tactics of the enemy. He entices you to do something, and then guess who's the first to condemn you once you've done it? The enemy. How could you do this to God? Right? Like, it's one of his tactics. To keep you from going back to him. To keep you from epistrepho, turning back, turning your whole self to him. To keep you from repenting. There is not anything that the Lord God does not forgive. Amen? Even our arrogant pride, even our habitual sin, fill in the blank. God loves you. And he calls you to him. We know exactly how the Father behaves with Luke chapter 15, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and powerfully the parable of the prodigal son, telling us exactly what kind of attitude the father has towards a sinner. Tells us exactly what it's like. It's difficult. It took many years for me to conform to that thinking of God. That God actually functions that way. Because the religious spirit was proud in me. That I would say, well, you know, listen, there's certain sins that, boy, you do that, you're just really a piece of work. And I would stand on my self-righteous hill, pounding my chest, not realizing that logs just all over in my eyes. Remember Jesus said, hey, before you take care of your, your brother's log, why don't you, I'm sorry, the speck in your brother's eye, why don't you take care of the logs in your own? 
but the spiritual, religious spirit blinds us to our own logs. Keeps them hidden. So here we've got Peter. Listen, you're going you're gonna to fail. You put, you put your faith in yourself, Peter. You're going to fall on your face every time. And Peter had to do this a few times until it finally clicked. We'll get later on when we see this transformation begin to take uh, place in Peter. But David even talks about this in, in the Psalms. In Psalm 51, uh, you all remember when David sinned with Bathsheba. Nathan the prophet goes and calls him out, says, David, you're the man. You're the one that has done this. Right? And he gives him the story about the shepherd. The one shepherd, uh, he had lots of sheep, but he wasn't content with his own sheep. He went and took a neighbor's sheep. He only had one sheep, but it was a very precious sheep to him. But the, the shepherd with a bunch of sheep went and took this other man's sheep. What do you think should be done to that man, David? And David being a shepherd, right? Oh, that boy is like, oh, you got to get him. I'll tell you what needs to happen. There needs to be five sheep taken from the shepherd with many and given to the one they take. That one that did that is, that is a horrible, horrible person, horrible thing. Nathan says, you're the man. You're it. Can you imagine what that would be like going to the king and telling him, you're the man. And you have done egregious sin. And unless you get right, you're separated from God. Nathan's risking his life doing this to a king. But the point that I want to get at and highlight is David then penned Psalm 51. And he approaches God in a very interesting way. He approaches God reflecting upon the everlasting, enduring love, steadfast love of God. Remember when we talked about that word steadfast? It's that Hebrew word hased. It's covenantal love. He approached God through covenant, recognizing, I have sinned against you, Lord God. I have done a horrible wrong. I ask that you respond to me through your loving kindness, through this covenantal love, so that I can also go and teach other transgressors who you are. The forgiveness of this God who forgives sin and iniquity. Intentional, purposeful sin. David did not have a religious spirit. As king, he could have easily prided himself up, stiffened his back, but goes, I can do what I want. I'm the king. Be gone, Nathan. He could say, well, I can justify whatever it is I want to justify. I don't even have to answer to you, Nathan. I'm the king. Get out of here. He could have done anything he wanted. He didn't have a religious spirit. He had a heart that was what? After God's own heart. He was interested in knowing the heart of God. Not what the priests have to say about God. He wanted to know him. And beloved David did know him. And this is why you see David saying, man, Lord, please, I have, uh, I have horribly sinned against you against heaven, against all of this. I have, I have messed up royally. But respond to me in the characteristic, the attributes of who you are, that when I shuv, the Hebrew word turn, repent, come to you, you respond with this covenantal love and embracing. Teach this to my heart, Lord God, so that I can instruct others with this understanding. Is that the heart producing in you? Or is it the heart that goes, stands aloof? goes, well, at least I'm not like one of these sinners over here. Remember, Jesus had that talk with the Pharisees. So, beloved, this is when the reason why I'm spending so much time in these latter portions of the gospel is because this is when you start putting some real action to your faith. This is when it becomes real. This starts transforming from just Bible knowledge to is it is your heart conforming? Is it turning to the Lord God? Or do you stay stiff with where, we're, with where you're at? None of us have arrived here perfectly. None of us has made it. Like we finally have made the spiritual ascent. We are always ascending to the glory of God. Jesus is the only one capable of putting on a pedestal and honoring and emulating. Amen? Paul was 
striving after this so greatly that he was capable of say, saying, follow me as I follow Christ. Would you dare do that with your life? If you can't say that you can do that with your life, ask yourself, why? What are you keeping back from God? Paul recognized, man, all of my good works, all the righteous things that I did, they are but filthy rags. They're nothing to this. They're nothing compared to this God. Paul, of all people, understood the religious spirit. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees under Gamiel, the top of the Pharisees. I mean, he was going to succeed him. This boy was religious through and through. He even talks about, let me tell you how bad of a sinner I was, says Paul. I was so rotten. I was so like self-righteous and conceited that when Stephen was stoned, I wouldn't even throw the stone. I stood with the coats and gave the approval to everybody else because I'm so righteous, I didn't want to have the, the dirtiness of throwing the stone on my hands. But I gave consent for everybody else to go egregiously sin. Paul understood, I mean, listen, do you even see points with an axe of this working out in Paul where you see him using his pharisaical training to try to entrap people? You still see it taking place. You see it working in Paul. Paul didn't suddenly just arrive. It was a perpetual work within him. And I, I beloved, I got to tell you, if Paul's work are but filthy rags before Christ, I darn well know the rest of ours is as well. Collectively. The good works that we do come out of obedience to the God who has done so much for us. Amen? But that is not what does any transformative work within us. It's the Spirit. It's the Spirit. The Spirit of God has got to do this in us. And this is something the disciples were just not getting. It wasn't, Peter relied on his own strength, but it didn't, it didn't click. It didn't work. Go back to Matthew 26. And I want to read Matthew's account of Peter's denial. And I want to highlight a few things. Matthew chapter 26, verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let me just pause here. Our English translations say they sung a hymn. And they, they, they're making hymn a noun, like they did a hymn, a song. But in the Greek, it's actually, they, they did a hymning. It's a verb. They sing multiple songs. And every Passover, the Jewish nation sings Psalms 113 through 118. Well, Psalm 118, we don't have time to do this, but it's really cool. Go read Psalm 118. In fact, you could read them all and think about, this is literally the songs that are on, on their minds, on their lips. They know them by heart. It's part of festivities, and it talks all about who God is, the character of God, the love of God, the power of God, how his love and presence is everlasting and enduring, and it goes on and on and on. That was just on their lips. And then, as they go out to the Mount of Olives, Jesus says, says to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. All of you. They just sang songs about the everlasting love of God. Seeking his name, the presence of God. Just like we do on Sundays. We sing songs with our lips. We sing them and praise them out, but then we go on about our lives, carrying on just like nothing's ever happened. The songs were on their lips, but it did nothing to change the heart. It did nothing to conform them more to the image of God or what even God was doing. All of you will fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Pro uh, quoted from Zechariah. Zechariah is the most quoted Old Testament prophet in the New Testament. Huge significance in all of these things. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. So notice what Jesus is saying. Notice his knowledge. 
He knows exactly everything that's going to happen. You are all going to fall away from me. He says to Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me. Satan has asked to sift all of you, but I have prayed for you that your faith would hold out. Jesus is cognizant of everything going on, fully aware. Never for a moment is he like somehow displaced from his godness. He's fully aware of everything going on. This is significant because of what's coming up. Jesus is also saying, after I am raised up. So he knows he's going to resurrect. He, by the way, he's told this to his disciples. How many times in the Gospel of Matthew alone? Four times everything that was going to happen. Four times he tells them what's going to take place. He's telling them again. Literally hours before it's about to take place, he's telling them again. And he also tells them where he's going to find them. You will find me up in Galilee. Jesus is telling them everything that's going to happen. Now look, Peter answered him, Though, here's Peter again, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples did the same. In about three hours' time, Jesus' words are going to be proven true. Then Jesus went with them, to a place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane, uh, it means like a pressing place. I've got a picture of that to show you what the amount of olives looks like and what Gethsemane. Gethsemane will be, um, it was a, a section located in the garden and there would have been a oil press there. Jesus is literally going to the place called the pressing place at the Mount of Olives in order to be squeezed, in order to be pressed, in order to be crushed. Do we have that picture? Awesome. So here's the Mount of Olives. It's what it looks like today. This outer side of the bark, these, this bark, these this parts of the trees actually date back to about the time of Jesus. Pretty cool. I've been there. Got to touch it. It's pretty cool. Uh, okay. Um, next next slide. So this would have been something similar like this within the Garden of Gethsemane. You'd put the olives in there. When you put in the olives, you would put a, a wood through that stone, and you would typically attach it to a donkey. Next picture. And this is kind of what it would look like. And then they would drive the donkey around the press, and that heavy stone would press. It's a millstone. You would use different millstones for wheat, for barley, for olives, for grapes. This is what Jesus says. Anybody leads any children astray, tie this around their neck and throw them in the sea. Jesus gives pretty clear what he feels about when evil happens to children. So if that's the evil... I'm, I'm, I'm not going to rabbit trail there. I'll just I'll leave it at that. So this is where Jesus is going to, to the garden, the Mount of Olives, to specifically Gethsemane, where the olive press would be, because he's about to go through a pressing. He's about to go through this intense pressure. So he goes to Gethsemane, and he says to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. But notice who he takes with him, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John. These are the same three boys that got to witness something else pretty miraculous with Jesus. What was that? Transfiguration. Now, why was the transfiguration significant? Transfiguration is significant. If you remember back in Matthew chapter 16, when we talked about Jesus going up to Caesarea Philippi, Jesus leaves the entire area where he's doing all the ministry, around the Sea of Galilee, around in Jerusalem. He leaves all that area. He marches north into a Gentile territory to stand at a temple to the god of Pan where Caesars are worshipped, children have been sacrificed, all sorts of stuff have gone up there. He goes and stands at the opening of this cave. The cave is called the Gates of Hell. And he stands there and says, who do the people say that I am? Well, some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're this, some say you're a prophet, some say yada, yada. Who do you say that I am? Peter speaks up. I got this one, boys, held back here. You're the son of God. That's how you answer that. Well done, Peter. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven has. And your name is Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Y'all remember when we went through this in the Greek, it doesn't say against. It says the gates of hell will not withstand. Jesus went up to Caesarea Philippi, literally in the place known in Jewish theology, Mount Hermon. 
Caesarea Philippi is at the base of Mount Hermon. Jewish theology, this is where the sons of God, Genesis chapter 6, came down to earth. And then the Nephilim and all this kind of stuff comes along. This is a very significant place in Jewish theology and for Gentiles alike. This is the access to the pits of hell that only the God of Pan can go in and out of. He can access both the, 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 the dead and the living. He's the only one that can access both places. He looks like a, a goat man. He's got horns and a tail, and he carries a staff. And this is where early church tradition got the drawing for the devil. Jesus goes up there. Do you remember what the significance of that moment was? He goes up there, and he says to what? I am fulfilling, he's telling the whole spiritual world, I am fulfilling Genesis chapter 3, what was spoken of me, that I will crush the head of the serpent. Behold, I'm here to do it. That's what he's saying to the whole demonic world. This is why before Jesus gets there, the enemy tries to send down this storm to capsize and kill all the disciples and Jesus in the boat. This is what the scriptures are getting across to us. There are things more spiritually that are going on around us than what you're even cognizant of. That's how the enemy does his best work. He hides in the shadows. He's like a ghost. You never see him, but he's there. This is why Jesus told, told us in Matthew 13 that the birds of the air, he defined what the birds of the air were earlier in the parable of the sower, that they are demonic spirits that come and snatch away the things of God, that those birds of the air will make their nests in my church. A bird only makes its nest where it is comfortable to raise its offspring. This is why believers, we have to be like paying attention to what's going on and what's happening. Where is our own personal walk growing? Are we deepening our walk with Christ? Does it do anything when I read the word of God? Or is it simply religious tradition that I go to church on Sunday? Do the thing, man, our preacher sure is, sure is long-winded. I wish, I wish he fit the mold. We get, you know, give us a hymn and give us a 25-minute pep talk and we can get on about our ways to have lunch. Okay? Like... I'm familiar with church stuff too. But the reality is there's something, and especially now, man, times are different. We are in desperate need of an outpouring of the Spirit of God. Yes. And that begins in the house of God. It always begins with believers. But what quenches it and what stifles it, what literally chokes it out is the religious spirit. It kills it. It doesn't want it. It finds itself righteous enough. It, it eludes everybody else. It hides. It has no involvement with anybody else. It just simply, hi, hi, nice to see you. And then, it, boom, gone. Zero involvement. That's, that is modern day Christianity, is it not? Few people are involved with any of our kids. The very ones we're called to disciple. This is why this casual cultural Christianity thing, I'm trying to help break that. Break that thinking. Look at what the scriptures allude to, this intimacy with God, this moving with God, that there is this ability to have deep, intimate relationship with the Most High God in every aspect of my life. And where it's going to manifest most immediately is with my husband and wife. That my marriage reflects the union that God has made with me. That people, by seeing my marriage, want to be married. Do you understand that this thing called dink is really popular among my generation and younger? Double income, no kids. That's what it, dink. I'm a dink. <laughs> Hashtag dink. All this nonsense. Double income, no kids. It's looking at kids as though they're a burden. Women in the Bible, when they were barren, they thought it was a curse. They cherished life. They wanted life. Not our country. Our country wants to execute life, both in the unborn and in the elderly. It wants to eradicate it. I'm telling you, beloved, the only way that we can recognize how to even interact and truly properly understand where we don't understand these things politically, but we understand the things biblically is for us to use the scripture to help us to understand, right? What's going on? But what prevents that attitude? When I look out at them and I go, look at those dirty sinners. What prevents it from me missing the blind spots in my own life? It's the spirit of God. 
because I can stand very proudly and very erect and curse everyone else that I think is beneath me. It's very easy to do. Praise God Jesus didn't do that to us. He demonstrated something entirely different, and yet his disciples didn't get it. That means there's courage for us. Man, if the disciples who literally walked with Jesus didn't get it, and it took them some time, so it's a perpetual work that can happen in us as well. And look, Jesus goes to the garden. Sit here while I go over there. He takes Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he be, takes them a little further with them, and he, says, and he begins to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he says to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to his disciples, and he found them sleeping. He said to Peter, another gospel says, and he says to Peter, Simon, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Please stay with me through all of this, because this is another part of, portion of text that we're very familiar with, but there are details here that we must recognize and see. Let me just back up here for a moment. Jesus goes to Gethsemane, the pressing place, and he says to Peter, James, and John, my soul is very sorrowful even to, to this point of death. Remain here and watch with me. This is something that is going on. Jesus is telling us something intense is starting to happen to him. Something intense. Remember we had this intense emotion prior. I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now comes the moment of suffering, and it's, it's, it's exceedingly great. And Jesus is saying, look, it's so exceedingly great, my soul is very sorrowful to the point even to death. Like, I'm going I'm to fall. I'm going to collapse. It's getting extremely heavy and intense. And he says to them, remain here and watch with me. Watch with me. Watch with me. What this is trying to imply in Gritted Cross, I just want to look at this aspect of watch. He's saying, pay attention to what's happening around you. You know that the Bible talks about watchmen other places in the scriptures. Anybody ever heard of a watchman in the Bible? Okay, the Bible talks about watchmen in numerous places. One of the things that a watchman was to do was they stood on a tower and they watched in the distance, seeing if an enemy or a friend was coming, and they would announce it to everybody else, that an enemy's coming, or a friend is coming. This is why when Jehu, when Jehu in Israel's history was coming to uh, Ahab's kingdom to kill Jezebel, they see a company coming. The watchman says, it, says hey, I see, a, I see a company coming. All right, send out a horseman to him and find out if they're a friend or foe. The watchmans are to pay attention. The prophets acted as watchmen, and they would tell people what was going on and what was happening. Pay attention, because if you, don't, if you don't straighten this out, if you don't repent and turn, destruction is coming. Well, those watchmen weren't often liked too much. Most of the prophets have some pretty terrible things happen to them. Those watchmen weren't wanted. And what happens is the Bible is also including us as watchmen, every single one of us, men especially, because we are the spiritual leaders of the home. It's telling us that we need to be watchmen to pay attention to what's going on around us. This isn't only external threats. This is also internal threats. Does that make sense? Stay here and watch and pray. He just told them what Satan was going to try to do to them. Now's your moment to pray, Peter, and pray for strength that you'll see through the trial that's coming your way. And what does Peter and the rest of the boys do? Is that not the spiritual state of the American church or what? It's not watching and praying for nothing. And when it does watch and it, it, and it notices and it sees, it often comes from a religious spirit. And here is Jesus saying, look, my soul is very troubled. So something is about to come to me. This is often when he goes and he goes a little further and he falls on his face and he prays saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. 
This is often interpreted as Jesus is trying to get out of going to the cross. I can tell you, beloved, that is not even remotely close to being acceptably accurate. Because of time, we'll catch that next week. This is one of the most important aspects because how I think about God affects everything else about me. Jesus isn't trying to get out of anything. And we're going to examine this text next week. Extracting what is God actually doing. Father, we come before you and we praise you. 